Last week's Phobias as Demons Part 6 episode I think is some of the best storytelling I've done on this channel, and people in particular seem to respond really well to the third story in that episode, and so maybe that character is going to be showing up again soon, but anyway, I thought since lots of people still seem to be into the Demon series, I would try a spin-off now that I've been wanting to try for a little while, which is Animals as Demons. And obviously I've already done a few Animals as Demons in the Phobias as Demons series, but this is going to be formatted a little bit more like my Dinosaur Demons episode. Episodes. In terms of the lore, anyway, you'll you'll see what I mean soon. In fact, right now, let's just get into it, shall we? Let's go. Hit like if you want. Subscribe if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. Something I've become certain of in the last while is that all demons of fear were originally spawned from one being. Her true name is unbeknownst to me, but she is often referred to as Fear herself. A small number of her demons of fear have also, unfortunately, come to the realization that, like she created demons to do her bidding, they could then create demons of their own. Soriaclis was one of these demons who became a demon general by making his own demon spawn, but another of these is Zuphiathan. This demon hungers for those with a fear of animals, and as such has no shortage of living creatures to base its demons off of. It has created dozens of demons to further instill a fear of animals into its victims so that they can then feed and send the grim energy they absorb to strengthen their master. One of these demons spawned is Claboclack. This demon can teleport itself into the next nearest body of water to it, so it will often transport itself through neighborhoods with pools in the late of night, until it senses one with a fear of animals. Even better if it can find one with caboraphobia, the fear of crabs and lobsters. When it senses that it is close, it will then open its maw wide and vomit forth a massive cast of small crabs to scuttle their way into the home of the prey it seeks. All these crabs have a toxin within their claws, so that once they pinch their prey and puncture their skin, the victim will near instantly lose their voice. The crabs will awaken their prey with this initial pinch, then lure the panicking prey outside to the pool where Claboclack waits. To ensure it doesn't injure the prey too severely yet, Claboclack will reach out of the pool a pair of orange human hands to grab the victim and pull them under. It will then open its maw to re-consume the cast of crabs, then transport itself and its victim across as many bodies of water as it needs to until it reaches a private beachside. It will then release its prey and allow them to scramble to shore. They can then run and try calling for help to no avail, but Claboclack will always scamper its way into their path, clacking its massive claws closer and closer to the victim's face. Once it has cut off their escape enough times, it will then even snatch them by one of their limbs and hurl them back into the water. If it senses any aid approaching, it will then simply grab its prey once more and transport them to a new location to continue their torment. This demon will often be satisfied with the fear it has wrenched forth after a few hours, and then it will snip its prey to pieces before devouring the severed bits one by one. Now I was actually kind of surprised to see in the comment section of the last Phobias as Demons episode a bunch of requests for a fear of crabs. I mean it was probably only like three or four people, but it's, it still seemed like such a specific one that I didn't know was a thing, that I was just surprised seeing it pop up a bunch of times, so I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I really love doing crab-based designs or even insect-based designs, and I don't really do a ton of them, slightly partially because with insect or crab kind of designs, Often I have to do a lot of limbs that can be a little bit tedious to position them all. And looking at this one now, I'm even realizing I probably didn't give it enough limbs because crabs are decopods. They're supposed to have 10 limbs. And from looking at this, I only gave it eight. Although you could argue that one of the sets of legs is just in behind it, obscured by its big body. One critique I have seen of my demon designs a couple times is that some of them don't quite look demon-y enough, like they just look like they could fit into my fantasy monster series or something, and like they kind of just look like dire animals. And I guess I do do a bit of that in this, just doing like dire, slightly monster versions of the animals that I'm basing these demons off of. And this crab probably leans more into that than some of the other ones, but I do think I have some more creepy, demon-y sort of designs coming up, especially in the next drawing. So we'll get into that one in a sec, but first let's take a look at this.
Paul had just about had it with the cat he'd gotten his daughter Bailey. He'd gotten the thing as a kitten to try and help his daughter get over her massive fear of animals, but it hadn't done much good. For one thing, the cat had grown unusually quickly, only having stayed a kitten size for about a week. Bailey also came running into Paul's rooms many nights, screaming that the thing was eerily grinning at her while she slept, and even clawing at the girl's skin. But Paul never saw any marks, and never saw any evidence of it himself. Still, the cat was pretty odd. Worse still, it had started hissing furiously any time Paul's new neighbor stepped outside her home. Early on, the woman had even seen it screeching at her, and in response, she'd given the cat the finger as she took out the garbage. Not a great first impression for Paul, who thought the woman was pretty attractive. They hadn't formally met yet, but he knew she was also a single parent herself, with a daughter that could potentially be friends with Bailey. He'd gotten to a point where he was considering options of how to get rid of the animal. But soon, that wouldn't be necessary. He awoke one night with a fright, unsure of why, but just knowing that he had a strong sense that something was wrong. He looked around with his heart pounding and tried to calmly get out of bed, despite his adrenaline rushing. He opened his bedroom door and walked down the hall. He headed to his daughter's door and listened in. He heard nothing. But after a moment, that ended up feeling strange. It was almost too quiet. Bailey was not a calm sleeper. Often Paul would hear her tossing and turning, or at least breathing heavily. He quietly turned the handle, but as soon as the door was the slightest crack open, sound exploded from the room, hissing and roaring like there was a zoo inside, along with the nearly drowned out sounds of Bailey screaming. Well silent a second ago, now the sound could have been heard across the block. Paul ripped open the door to see that the room had somehow stretched to five times its size. In its center was Bailey, surrounded by tigers with disfigured heads, lions with blood spilling from their eyes, and what appeared to be a humanoid version of their pet cat, flaring its claws at the girl. Little did Paul know that the creature he'd adopted was no mere kitten, but the shape-shifting cat demon, Alorophene. The demon looked up at him, past the horrified crying child, but none of the surrounding felines turned. They just kept roaring and hissing with near deafening noise. Paul had no idea what to do, but on instinct he just ran towards Bailey. The demon flared its claws and two of the tigers stomped into his path. Paul tried to leap over them, but tripped over his own feet and fell right towards one of the beast's jaws. But ended up falling through it. He hit the ground and sprung up quickly, finding he was able to pass his hands through the creatures. They were just illusions. Still, he had to get Bailey out of there. He ran through the rest of the cats and reached out to grab his daughter, but was slashed across the face by the demon. It was certainly no illusion. Four gashes cut open across Paul's face as he was flung back to the ground. The demon snickered in a vile hiss. What's the matter? I thought you wanted Bailey and me to become more acquainted. It patted its paw roughly on the girl's head and she shook with violent tears. Even though it felt futile, Paul was about ready to try leaping up again, when a boisterous voice called from the door behind him. Oh, I knew it from the second I saw that thing that you had one f***ed up cat. Standing tall at the room door was his new neighbor, Tamika, holding a shotgun in bright pink pajamas. She cocked her gun and fired at one of the tigers, just to see the bullets fly through it. Paul stammered out, the, Only that one is real! She looked up at the humanoid demon cat and stomped forward. Oh, hell no, stay away from that child, she doesn't need to see none of your weird furry sh** at her age. The demon raised a claw to her, but she aimed up and blew the paw to pieces. It hissed furiously and leapt over the child, lunging its fangs at Tamika. She crammed the barrel of her gun right into the demon's throat and slammed the creature to the ground. The demon choked as it tried to hiss again, but Tamika said, How's this for a furball, you boogly-eyed freak? She unloaded and the demon's body burst into a puff of hair and black smoke. All the illusions suddenly vanished, and the room shrank back to its normal size. Paul leapt up and wrapped his arms around his still-shaking daughter. There was a brief moment of calm, but then they both suddenly leapt in terror as another shot rang from Tamika's gun. Paul whipped around to see that she had just shot one of Bailey's dolls off her shelf. It was now blown to pieces on the floor. He looked up at her, confused, and she just said, Don't trust those things, neither. Some of them got goo in them. 
I was so happy to see the response to Tamika in the comment section of the last video and her doll story. I like I thought that story was going to be funny and really catch people off guard, but the the comments were even Benny Sharp didn't get that good of a response when I first created him. And I think the main reason for that was it was just such a shock. For one thing, I never swear on this channel, so having a swear word even completely bleeped out to still keep things PG would be a massive shock to people. And the fact that when I started writing that story, I wasn't writing it as a funny story from the start. But I got to a point where the story was going to be too long at the point where the doll was showing up in Tamika's bedroom, and I was like, what if I just have Tamika go all out right from here? Like, she is not gonna take any more of this weirdness. And so it kind of double caught people off guard, and part of the inspiration for having the bleeped swearing was actually from Puss in Boots The Last Wish. For anyone that's seen it, or hasn't seen it, I guess, there's a character in it called Purito, who's the, like, cute little chihuahua dog character, and there are a couple times where he swears and it's bleeped out, and it is just so hilarious, and that movie is still PG, so apparently you can do that and still have things be PG. But anyway, I was super happy to bring her back, but I also know that this isn't a joke that I can overuse, like the shock factor will wear off. So if I'm gonna bring her back, I gotta, you know, try and make sure I still have funny lines for her that aren't just reliant on that. Anyway, I hope you all like this art and story. Let's take a look at the finished drawing. Many demons thrive in an environment where they can swim. Some have the ability to swim through the air, some will bring their victims to the water, but Crocelitoc is one of the few who will bring the water to its prey. A young man named James was the most recent victim hunted by this creature. It had sought him for his deep-rooted fear of crocodiles, for as a child, he'd seen them being fed at a local zoo, and in the havoc that ensued as their meal was hurled into their cage, one of the crocs snatched another by the leg and rolled in the dirt until it had torn the other's foot off and devoured it. This was a traumatic and horrifying sight that remained burned in his mind for years to come. Seeing a simple image of a crocodile or alligator or even large lizard would cause his heart to pound and his breathing to shallow. The night Crocalitoc came for him, James was awoken as he heard his closet door ever so slowly creaking open. He thought little of it at first as his family home had drafts, but when he glanced over, he could see looming in the darkness two glowing green lights. His mind cycled through possibilities of what they could be, but he had no idea. He sat up to look closer, and as he did, he noticed that a puddle of water was spilling out of his closet. And the second he saw it, the water started coming faster and faster, until it was practically a tidal wave pouring out and filling his room. James tried calling out for anyone to help, but nobody came. Within a moment, the water had half filled the room, and that was when the eyes came closer. Just peeking out of the water were not one, but three sets of eyes skimming across the still rising tide. James backed farther onto his bed that was being lifted higher and higher. The creature dove down and vanished in the swirl of water, and soon, James's head thudded against the ceiling. He tried lying flat to stay on the bed, but before the water rose more, the bed was flipped from beneath, and the boy dropped into the water, seeing a large, snarling crocodile floating before him. He tried to swim towards the window, but the creature bit into his leg and death rolled around and around, disorienting James and getting him closer and closer to drowning before releasing him. He swam up to the surface and got the briefest breath of air before he was dragged under again and spun once more. This happened two, three more times, and even through the swell of water around him, James could feel tears burning on his cheeks. But even in his confused, terrified desperation, after a moment of considering just giving up, he remembered what he'd learned about crocodiles. After years of having been horrified of them, he decided to try to solve his fear by learning all he could about them, to give him some semblance of hope that if he did ever come near one, he'd have something he could do. And there was at least one piece of information that could prove useful. The next time the croc released him, instead of swimming for air, despite desperately needing it, he spun around and wrapped his arms right over its mouth to hold it shut. This thing clearly wasn't a normal croc, but he hoped it would still have the same weaknesses. The croc thrashed and thrashed, but couldn't get its mouth open. 
You see, crocodiles may have incredibly powerful bites, but their muscles to open their jaws is very weak in comparison. James's lungs felt like they would explode, but he knew he couldn't afford to let the creature's mouth open again. He stared it in its eyes, and to his surprise, it actually started to cry. Or at least, purple ooze started to spill from its eyes. Still wrapped around it, James pulled back one of his hands and crammed his fingers right into its eye. The creature thrashed its head aside in pain and slammed James against the window, which shattered open and he was poured out onto the roof of his home. The water pushed him and he rolled until he was just able to grab the ledge of the roof. He was finally able to gasp in air as the last of the water trickled down around him. He pulled himself back onto the roof and limped on a broken leg over to his room. He looked inside and there was nothing there. The window was still shattered, but everything was dry, except for James, and all his furniture was back in its proper place. James was soon after approached in secret by a member of the Predator Coalition of Demon Hunters named Peter, who told him about the creature that he'd faced. While it had been a treacherous incident, the experience gave James confidence unlike anything he'd had in his life. If he could beat a demon crocodile, then he felt he could handle anything else life threw his way. Now in preparation for this, I did a bit of research on crocodiles and watched some videos of crocodiles and they kind of are demons already. Watching some of the videos of them doing those death rolls where they'll just bite into the, the limb or the head of something else and spin and like just tear it off is pretty gruesome and in fact I worked one of the ideas from one of the videos I saw into this where I saw a video on YouTube that has like 20 million views of a bunch of crocodiles being fed and then one of them just turns and bites the leg of another one death rolls and rips the leg off and swallows it and then they both just kind of keep laying there chilling like nothing has happened and it's pretty wild to watch so I knew I wanted to work the death roll into this. Man, there's a bunch of things I feel like I could talk about in terms of the design and the story, but I guess that's part of the reason I'm loving doing the Design Notes podcast as a bonus thing on the Popgrass Studios Patreon. Because in that, I can just talk for like 20 minutes or half an hour straight about the story design and the art design, and I'm not bogging down the flow of stories at all. But anyway, love how this one turned out. Could probably fit into my Dinosaur Demon series too, but it's in this series instead. Swooping season is something more commonly known to residents of Australia. It is a time of year when magpies' eggs will hatch and they'll aggressively protect their nests by swooping at and attacking animals and people that tread too close. This can be a frightening event for anyone, but the demon Ornothus uses it all across the world to stir uncontrollable terror into those with a specific fear of birds. Ornothus flies above the clouds and can sense those with a fear of birds from hundreds of feet up. When it feels the pull of its hunger, the eyes that litter its wings will zoom down and look all around the area below until it spots its prey. It will bellow out a booming caw that will just barely be audible from the earth below and send a chill down the spine of the prey it seeks. This call will also spur into the being of all birds below a sense that this target is a direct threat to their lives and their nests. The birds will then start swooping down and pecking and scratching at the head and arms of the poor victim. They'll likely then look for any way to get indoors, away from the birds, and Ornothus will start descending. Waiting until just before the victim has gotten close to a doorway, then it will snatch them in its massive talons and carry them off. It will keep its torrent of birds attacking and pecking while it carries them by their arms so they can do little but thrash at the attacking birds. Ornothus will then even turn its neck down and simply stare at its prey with menacing eyes as it flies. It will fly near buildings and cliffs, looking as though it may crash to further instill in its victim the fear that they could soon fall to their death. Eventually, the demon will soar higher and higher into the air, then drop its victim. They'll fall and fall still with birds swooping in and slashing at them. Eventually, they'll fall unconscious, a brief, peaceful reprieve. But as soon as they awaken, they'll find themselves in a round, encased nest, like a final cage full of all kinds of birds that will peck and slash the victim to death, with Ornothus looming outside, drinking in all the fear that continues to seep from them until their bitter end. 
Now this is an episode where I feel like I did a good job with all of the designs in it, I'm very happy with them, but this one is the fourth one because it's my least favorite of all of them. I don't always put my least favorite design of the end, but it, you know, maybe like 40% of the time I'll do that. And I, I don't dislike the, this one, in fact, I am pretty pleased with it overall. I particularly like how the head turned out, like it's, I really like its weird tongue. I think I talked about in my Avengers as Penguins episode, how how penguins and some birds like ducks have really weird stuff going on with their teeth, like teeth sticking up off the side of their tongue, and penguins will have like four different rows of teeth inside their beak, and there's some really weird looking stuff going on with some of those birds, and I liked working that on this, even though I have kind of used it before in in this series, in fact, with uh, the fear of a duck watching you from somewhere, that joke demon that I did, it had some of those teeth sticking off the tongue, but I think I did a better job rendering it here. From its beak, I was pulling inspiration from a shoebill stork. It's a type of bird that you might have seen before, even if you don't know it by name. That's got a really big fat beak and a, a really menacing kind of leer to it. It's a pretty awesome looking bird, and I'm very pleased with how I got the shape of it on this bird here. One element that I don't love is how I did the eyes on the wings. I was taking inspiration from biblically accurate depictions of angels, which are just like big wings with weird halo things flying around them and eyes on the wings. But in this case, I kind of wish I'd thought a little bit more logically about how the eyes are stuck to the wings, not just kind of like floating on the feathers. And I've talked before about how demons are fun to design because they don't have to make sense anatomically. Like when you look at them, it's almost like it should be the opposite, like you should be confused about how this thing could exist. But in this case, I feel like it would have made the design feel a little bit more cohesive if I'd had some kind of way that the eyes were stuck to the wings, like, like a way that you look at it and it kind of makes a little bit more sense to you. I also don't yet love a rendering style for feathered wings. I feel like that's something I'll want to figure out. I've done decent jobs at it before, but I don't love my technique for it. So I'm probably gonna figure out something better in the near future. But again, overall, pretty happy with this. And I don't think it detracts from the episode at all. And, you know, maybe this is even someone's favorite. So let's take a look at the finished result. That is a demon episode right there. I love this and I would love to do more, so give me other suggestions for other animals you'd like to see turned into demons next if I do a round two. Also, if you're new here, you might want to check out last week's Phobias as Demons episode. Also, a quick reminder that I do have a brand new ink bundle out up on the Popgrass Studios Teespring store, which you can find linked in the description, but that you can also get all of my inks and over 500 high resolution drawings and high res art a day before a video comes out, plus a bonus podcast on the Popgrass Studios Patreon. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave people with today is the idea that anxiety is not your enemy. It is a red flag pointing you towards something that you need to heal within yourself. A few months after I first started Popgrass Studios, I started having panic attacks for the first time in my life. Ended up having them for about two years, until I decided that I had to do something to make them stop. So I started reading books on overcoming anxiety and not ruminating so much. Started meditating daily, and now I haven't had one in over a year, and and I don't think I'm ever gonna have one again. And because the anxiety pointed me towards healing something in my internal life and how I was acting, everything in my life has become better since. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday.